Thank you all for attending. Um, my name is Phil Hall. I'm one of the account managers here at Rhino Networks. And uh, if you're not familiar with who Rhino Networks is or what we do, uh, I'm just going to give you a brief history before we get uh, started with today's event. Um, Rhino Networks grew out of a local MSP here in Western North Carolina. Um, we grew a great reputation with our customers within the area and about 11 years ago now, we were introduced to Rhino or to uh, Cisco Meraki, which at that point in time, it wasn't owned by Cisco yet, so it was just Meraki. Uh, we became a partner, and so when Cisco purchased them, we, uh, we moved into being a Cisco partner. And over the years, we've had great success with our customers, um, a lot of them being MSPs, some of them being end customers as well. And uh, we just learned to dedicate ourselves to one brand, uh, Cisco, seeing as it in our opinion, at least, is probably one of the better, if not full solutions out there, um, depending on where you go and what you look at in their portfolio. Uh, speaking to that, we're gonna be talking a lot about cyber liability insurance and Duo. Um, Rhino Network started working with Duo as a solution for our customers uh, right around the time Cisco uh, acquired them, just shortly thereafter. And one thing we like to do when we're talking about security with our customers is to be consultant minded. Uh, we're not here just to make a sale or anything like that. We want to come in, get to know your environment, make sure we're learning about what your objectives are and your needs are, and then make the right recommendations. Uh, Duo being one of those that we think is the right recommendation for everybody, especially in the growing landscape of uh, cyber attacks. With that said, I want to introduce Wes Spencer. Um, he is one of our panelists today. Wes is a nationally recognized technology innovator and cyber cybersecurity influencer. Um, he co-founded multiple security companies, um, including Perch Security. And Wes also has numerous rewards, including the 2020 Cybersecurity Educator of the Year by the Cybersecurity Excellence Awards. Wes has also been featured in the Wall Street Journal, ProPublica, Dark Reading, and many other outlets. Wes is the vice president channel chief and board vendor, board member for Fifth Wall Solutions, one of the nation's largest insurance brokers focusing exclusively on cyber security insurance. Wes is also the co-host of the Cyber Call with over 5,000 MSP weekly users. And outside of the office, which we talked about quite a bit during, uh, during our time just before this meeting, um, Wes fancies a tasty bourbon and some crispy hot chicken. So, uh, Wes, thank you for being with us today. And just to kind of get us started, um, can you tell us what cyber liability insurance is? Yeah, great question. So uh, there's there's some misperceptions in the industry around some of this, right? Where someone says, well, I, I got this cyber thing and it didn't cover me in a breach. And so I don't think this cyber thing is like, I don't think this, I don't think this is something that I need, right? And, and there's, there's a difference between a true standalone cyber insurance policy versus sometimes these carriers, and you're going to hear this from me today, are pretty, I can be kind of critical of them. Um, sometimes they'll just stick in what we call a warranty, and it's not made to pay out on anything. So a true cyber insurance policy gives you coverage for all kinds of cyber events and all kinds of things packed into those cyber events. So let me give you an example. It's not just like, you know, is it going to cover a ransomware attack? Generally speaking, the answer is yes, it'll cover a ransomware attack as long as you have the right things in place, which we'll also get to later in this webinar. But it covers a lot of things you may not have thought through, things like public relations, things like outages, things like lost business income, things like lawyer fees, things like digital forensics, all of these things that get packed into a breach that a lot of times clients don't understand in this day and age. Um, it, it covers a lot of those things. And so what it's really meant to be is not a get out of jail free card. It's meant to be a stopgap and a, what we call a risk transfer when you put the right things in place and you have a good cyber hygiene, you have all the things in place, it becomes that stopgap on top to say, look, it's not a question of if an attack is going to happen. It's a question of when. And so what are we going to do to be prepared when it happens? And so it's one of those things that gives you some coverage in the costs of those events. So great question. Awesome. Um, so hearing all that, you know, I, I know we have a lot of different types of listeners today. 
Um, some of them MSPs, some of them direct end users, some of them large companies, maybe some small companies or medium size. And I get this question a lot that uh, some small companies just don't think they need it, or even if they're medium size. However, they see themselves in the world today in their size of the company. Um, so why is this insurance becoming such a big thing? What are the problems uh, businesses are facing that might require all companies to look at this type of insurance? Yeah, great question. And, and it is growing like crazy. Um, in fact, it's the fastest growing line of insurance that exists today. And by the late 2030s, will become the biggest revenue line in, in all of insurance, bigger than auto, bigger than like, you know, uh, tech, like, you know, all these other things, right? It's going to become the biggest. So one of the things that I think clients misunderstand sometimes is they'll say things like, look, no one's coming after me. I'm not a target. I'm too small. No one cares about my data. You know, like, come on, man, I've never been hit by something before. Why would I be hit now? Or they're like, if I were to get hit by something, you know, I'd, I'd probably be 50,000 bucks. You know, just that's probably all I think a breach would cost. And unfortunately, those are misperceptions that I think are natural, but untrue. Uh, we, so in my background, I'm a, I'm a cybersecurity guy that's come into insurance. So I'm not like I, I've come from this practitioner's viewpoint in this world. And I've dealt with and worked with organizations that have gone through breaches, a whole bunch of them. And the reality is we're gonna have some data. We'll show you in a minute, but they're way more expensive than you think. And there's a lot of reasons for that because now we're in this day and age. Yeah, here we go. So we'll cover this data in a second, but now we're in this day and age where it's not just, oh, I paid a ransom and that's the only cost. Now you have lawsuits. You have third party and fourth party lawsuits where maybe the client of your client was out and could not operate simply because you were down. I took my family, my son to the Corvette factory um, where they actually build Corvettes last week. Uh, we did a vacation. He's huge into Corvettes. And one of the things they told me was their suppliers if their suppliers go down they actually fine their suppliers because they can't build corvettes what does that look like when you have someone saying look we make a hunt when we have an outage we're losing one hundred and twenty eight thousand dollars a second that's what the corvette factory said how does cyber rely go into that well i, I can answer that right those kind of outages are things that all of a sudden it's not just you that's having the outage, it's the, your clients and the clients of your clients. So it's a systemic supply chain. And so these are things that I just don't think people say when they say, like, I don't think I need this stuff because I'm not a, a target. You're absolutely a target. Think of it this way. If I'm a bad guy, am I going to try to go like Ocean's Eleven style, break, you know, like try to break into some downtown, you know, headquartered New York City Bank of America? Or am I going to try to go after Main Street Bank? Probably going to go after where the target's easiest. It's kind of like water, right? Path of least resistance. And that's what bad guys have done. They've come down market and they're going after smaller companies because it's easier for them to get in. They don't have the budget of Bank of America. So these are just some things you got to think about when it comes to cybersecurity, why it's important and why you need it because you are a target even if you don't think that you are. The data shows it and just anecdotally, I've seen this happen over and over and over and not being prepared for it can lead to really bad outcomes. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, and, and to go along with that, I know you and I have discussed this the other day. There's this idea of a loss to ratio, um, something that is a good, nice look at the data and what it's showing us today, what it's showing as people put into practice some of these uh, security measures. So do you mind speaking to that a little bit? Yeah. And if you would hold the graphic, because I want to tease something before, and then I'll let you know when to show the graphic. So so in the world of insurance, there's like basically one KPI that they care about. There's like one data point, and it's this. It's this idea of a, what's a, a loss ratio. And, and it's basically this. For every dollar that we bring in, how many pennies go out the back door to losses, right? Things like uh, we paid out on a loss, the cost of insurance, right? And so typically when you look at any line of insurance, a good loss ratio is about 15%, one five, 15%. What that means is the margins in insurance are not great. They have to operate profitably by operating in mass. And so if you're operating and you're like, look, we can't suffer more than 15% of every dollar we come in gets leaked out the back door. We can't, we can't survive if we go higher than that. Well, what's happened in the cyber insurance world is it's been really, really bad over the past year. So let's take a look at it. Let's show the graphic. 
And I want you to see just how bad cyber insurance is. So there's two things you're looking at here. You're looking at the green. The green is the cost of insurance. In other words, how much does it cost me to buy insurance? In the days before we saw a lot of down market attacks in 2018, maybe 2019 and backwards, you can see it wasn't that expensive to get cyber insurance. It was kind of like Oprah, like you get insurance, you get insurance, you get insurance, you all get insurance, right? It's easy. The carriers are like, look, psh, but no one's really going after small businesses. No problems here. I don't have to worry about this. Anyone can get insurance. We'll just give it to you for pennies on the dollar. It's simple. And you see the loss ratios kind of reflect this. Loss ratios were low, but not great. They're still not in that 15. In fact, they've never been in that 15% range that like auto insurance is and others. Well, what happened in 2019 and 2020? Two big things happened. One is bad guys figured out that small business are ripe for the plucking. A thousand employees and down, you are a target. And I saw this when I was at Perch, we saw this explosion in attacks. The main adversaries we fought against at Perch were um, called uh, Gand Crab, and, and what they spun out of is Revil or Sodno Kibi. Those are the two big threat actors. And they discovered that they could run ransomware in mass, get millions of dollars for it, and make off like bandits. And that's what happened. And so one thing that made it worse is like the bad guys are like, hey, hold my cyber beer, watch this. Then the, because the pandemic kicks in. And what happened in the pandemic in 20 and 21 was everyone starts working from home. We just spin up remote desktop and we just let people just connect in from the World Wide Web anywhere they're at. And that was the trigger moment that sent not only the cost of insurance through the roof in 2021, but also skyrocketed loss ratios. You see that blue line just goes hockey stick up. In other words, what's happening here is this. We've seen so many breaches and the cost of these breaches have skyrocketed to where the carriers are now at 72% losses. What that means is not only were they not profitable, they were losing money hand over fist. And keep in mind, the carriers are in this for money. They're for profit. And so when you have loss ratios that high, things don't end well. Basically, the carriers are like, look, we don't know what's going on here. It's going to get super expensive for you to get insurance because we're seeing so many attacks. And until we pull this down, we're not going to fix this. Now, in 2021, we saw a slight reduction in loss ratios. But then do you notice in 2022, it has come down big time. We saw a staggering drop. Now, fifth wall, we predicted this. We predicted that you'd see a reduction, but we did not predict and nobody predicted that we'd see such a staggering reduction in loss ratios. Now, the reason for this is because when you look at this data, what have the carriers been doing over the past year? They've said, you've got to do more. We are not in the business of insuring somebody that we should never give insurance to. In other words, like, look, if I drive an old car that you know is can barely drive, is burning oil, is no seat belts, is that an insurable risk for me? Probably not. Same thing in the world of cyber. Look, if you don't have multi-factor rolled out and you don't have things like EDR rolled out, you're not an insurable risk to us. And so they kind of cut off who they would insure and said, you got to have a better set of security controls in place. And that's what's pulled these loss ratios down. So we're finally in a market where we're getting control of this. And you see how the cost of insurance, that last green bar didn't go up that high? That's because we're starting to see a leveling off. We're starting to see maturity in cybersecurity and we're starting to see the carriers finally get their hands on this and say, you know what? Good security does reduce the likelihood of a breach and it does reduce the damages. And now we have actual scientific data really for the first time ever that shows good security equals good insurable risks and lower costs to these breaches. So that lower loss ratio, don't look at them like, well, that just helps the carrier, not me. No, it does help you. Because if the carriers are not paying off as many on breaches, that means you as a small business are not being hit as much, right? So it does correlate back to you. These controls actually make a difference. So there's a lot of data packed into just this one graph, isn't there? Yeah, no, for sure. And, and you hit on some of the other talking points that I wanted to ask you about, and that's really like, what are the requirements companies need to get cyber liability insurance? Since this horizon is changing ever so often and the attacks are getting more intelligent, all of these things, like what should companies do um, about the grow growing need for cyber liability insurance? What steps should they take that make them a, a risk that a company or insurance company wants to take? Yeah, great question. So 
keep in mind before we show you what these controls are, let me let me caveat a couple things here. So first of all, the carriers are the ones that see all the breaches, right? Because they pay out on the breaches. They're the ones that get all the data and all the aftermath on what happened, what caused it to happen, what could have stopped it from happening. They're like one of the only ground source of truth um, ways that you can get really good data on what causes breaches because they pay out, pay out on them. And so this is where we, we're going to show these to you in a second, but this is why that the data from the carriers is so good. And so at fifth wall, one of the things that we do is we work with about 43 carriers. So we, we, we know the carriers. Well, we talk to them every day. We have access to their underwriters, the people that are like making these decisions. And so one of the things that we have done is we've taken, we basically took every carrier that's out there and we looked at all their minimum requirements. See these carriers all have like five, 10 page questionnaires, but only a few things are required from the carrier. Like, look, these are non-negotiable, we gotta have these in place. So we took of all the 43 carriers we work with, we boiled down the five minimum controls that every single carrier expects. So they're not necessarily the best controls, they're not necessarily the only controls, but I'll tell you this, they are some of the most important things you can have in place. And if you don't have them in place, you're such an uninsurable risk to the carriers. They're like, look, we're just not even gonna insure you. Or if we do, we're gonna reduce our damages to you. And they're like, look, if you know, if you don't have things like multi-factor, like we're not, we're if you have ransomware attack, we're not gonna cover it. So let's get into those five controls, shall we? Sure. So the very first number one, that comes up is multi-factor everywhere. And so like Cisco Duo is a perfect example of this. One of the best platforms out there that I can think of for MFA and is, is awesome. Um, the reason this is so important is because multi-factor stops attacks, right? In the sense of, does it stop everything? No, there's no control that stops everything, but this is so important. Here's how important it is. I have friends at Microsoft in their um, incident response team. Like these are the ones that come into breaches at pretty big levels. And, and Microsoft will tell you 98% of the attacks that they deal with would be stopped if multi-factor were rolled out everywhere, period. So some people might be listening to this today and they're like, yeah, but what about multi-factor bypass and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, sure. But that doesn't mean that I don't put out one of the most important controls out there. It's sort of like saying like, oh, I've heard of people dying because they had a seatbelt on and they couldn't get out of the car. Well, sure. But like 99.999999% of deaths could have been prevented if the seatbelt was being worn. So like it's really important. And so what, what you see the carrier say is it's so important. We want it rolled out everywhere. Sorry, CEO that doesn't like multi-factor. You got to have it. And see, here's the thing. If you roll out a good platform like Duo, it's not actually that intrusive to their day-to-day -day usage. They think it's going to be like, oh, I got to put in this code every single... No, 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 you really don't. Reach out to the Duo folks and Rhino folks and they'll explain just how awesome Duo is and how simple it is. I mean, here I am. I make no money out of Duo, right? But I just know it's a great platform. So roll that thing out and it's got to be rolled out everywhere. The carriers now ask, is it rolled out for every single user? No holdbacks. Second big one is segregated, offline, or immutable backups. And what we mean by that is no more like I have a server in my network that like stores some local copies, or I have a NAS, you know, network attached storage, or I have, you know, like Dropbox that I put files in. Like there's nothing wrong with those things, but the carriers are like, look, bad guys go after that stuff. The first thing they do when they get access to your network is they look for your cloud storage. They look for your backup servers and they delete that stuff. And then they run the ransomware. So good offsite immutable backups, which means nobody can delete those backups until they hit their like retention schedule. Those things are, are worth their weight in gold to get your data back up and to prevent you from paying a ransom. So that's a big one. Um, EDR and antivirus, next gen antivirus, I'm gonna lump these into one. These are endpoint controls. If you want a good example, like Cisco AMP is a good example of a platform that does this. So these are systems that are looking for behavior on a network or on it really on a computer that looks abnormal. I'll give you an example. I put an alarm system in my home, not to keep a bad guy out, but to tell me when a bad guy gets in. Like, I don't ever get mad at my alarm system when it's like, well, it, you know, it didn't alarm me today. Well, that's because no one broke into my home today, right? The EDR and the next gen AV are doing that for your network. They're like, what are signs of weirdness that we may see that we want to alert on and take action on to kick something out before something really bad happens? That's why these tools at four and five, or really three and four, sorry, are so important because the carriers are like, look, 
we've seen a lot of times these aren't rolled out and then there's a breach. So we kind of make the correlation here. And then the last one is what you'd expect security awareness training and like fish testing, all that kind of stuff. This has become important because they've realized I, I don't like it when people say like your humans are your last line of defense. I like to say you're our first line of defense, right? In the sense of like, if you see something and you're like, hey, that phishing email, that email looks like a phishing email, like that says it's an invoice, but man, I'm not gonna open that, it looks sketchy. I'm gonna report this to my team. That can stop breaches, right? At the end of the day, stuff is gonna come in like that. You're gonna open something, install something, visit something, go somewhere, right? And so you see how all this plays together. We train our employees, we put tools to protect the endpoints, we safeguard our data, and then we also make sure that we have multi-factor on top so that we can protect our logins and protect our account credentials. These are things that are like really important. And that's why the carriers wanna see these five in place. And you're gonna have a hard time getting a policy if you don't have these five things in place. All right, good to know. Uh, Every single time we talk about this, uh, I'm learning more and more, um, which is going to make me be more of a consultant for my customers. So I really do appreciate it. Um, but I know one of the questions I'm going to ask, especially since on that last graph that we saw, the cost of insurance continually rising, right? It's like, it's inevitable. It's probably going to happen more. But the question I would have is, is it possible to reduce the cost of cyber liability by doing all the five things, maybe doing more things. Like, do you see a, a formula or an idea of a formula rising around this? Yeah, we have good news here, believe it or not. So if you had asked me last year, my answer would be different than this year because it's a data-driven answer. Last year, I'd say, no, just get ready for huge increases in price. It doesn't matter, 4X, 5X, maybe even 8X on increases in prices in insurance because loss ratios are so high and the carriers are like, this isn't working for us. But remember how we showed loss ratios are now coming down? What that means is we're saying, oh, we haven't arrived at where they need it to be. But we are, because loss ratios are coming down, what we're noticing is the carriers are saying this is working. And because it's working, you're going to see variance in carriers. In other words, here's the way it kind of works is you've got to shop the market when you're looking for insurance because the way the carriers price things is based on a lot of stuff it is a control review of those five controls and other things but they also look at your revenue they look at what industry you're in and you know maybe carrier a has seen a lot of like losses with cpa firms and you're a CPA firm and you have insurance with them. Well, next year you go to apply, they may be like, well, look, you're a high risk industry for us. So five times the cost. Carrier B down the street has not seen that many. And so because they haven't seen that many, like, oh, CPAs are actually a really great industry for us. So they're pretty cheap. That happens all the time. So a lot of times what clients don't know is they just think, oh, I just always use the same carrier every single time. Well, no, I would highly encourage you to shop the market because you might see many, many thousands of dollars of difference from one carrier to the next because of those differences. And as the loss ratios come down, it's not only going to make it, it's, it's just more important than ever to go shop the market and see what's out there and find the best carrier for you. And it may not be the same carrier every single year. And I always stay agnostic to that. Like we don't wear any carrier's flag. I don't preach the champion of any of them. I'm like, they're look at it as commodity shop and find the best one for the best coverages you can every single year. Sure. So. And it's funny. I just saw in chat, someone said, just like you would with car insurance every year, to be honest yeah. with you. I don't have time for that. Like as a human being, like I've got the kids, I've got the work, I've got the house, I've got all the things going on, right? I'm sure it's the same for companies like CEOs, CFOs, CIOs don't want to take the time every year. Like I've stuck with the same uh, insur car insurance carrier who now covers my house too since my great grandfather. Like we've all had the same one. Um, so the question I would have is, is there a resource out there and I know the answer to this, and that's why we had you here today. Um, but how can these companies utilize Fifth Wall to help mitigate all of that time loss that they could have searching for cyber liability insurance companies? Right. The classic way you'd go through this is, well, let's go pick three carriers that maybe we'd be good and go get their applications. And each one's 10 pages. And, you know, three weeks later, we've got our answer on the best price. That's kind of agonizing, right? And so 
one of the things we do at Fifth Wall is we have, we, we have, like I said, we have global access to the market. We work with 43 carriers. So no one has access like we do. The only thing we do is cyber insurance. We don't touch anything else. It's what we live, eat, breathe, sleep. And so we have what we call a unified application. We, we're, we're nerds over here. So we call it Lord of the Apps, like one app to rule them all, right? It's a, you know, it's, it's like today's May the 4th be with you. It's like a Lord of the Rings, they all part and parcel, right? And so what you can do with us is you can fill out just one application and then we'll go shop the market. And we're gonna come back with like a good, better, best policy for you. And so what's so nice about that and what clients love it is like, well, I gotta do an application every year anyway. Might as well do one for infinite options versus one for each, right? And so um, that's literally what we do. And it's a lifesaver and a time saver for for clients. Awesome. And I'm going to tack one more thing on here just because I did see another question come up where it's given the recommendation on who you should see. Does Fifth Wall also maybe recommend who you shouldn't? Like, say you're shopping and these insurance companies are going to shoot out uh, spam, if you will, uh, to try and get your business. Uh, does Fifth Wall? recommend who you should stay away from as well, just out of curiosity. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we never name names, you know, on webinars and things like that, of course, which sure. expect, yeah, yeah. but um, there, there are better carriers. So a lot of it can be industry specific. So the, the world of insurance is, is highly regulated. And so the terms they use are very standardized. Um, there's a lot of standardization in it. What's different is the kind of the rates and the way some of those things work. And what we've noticed is it's just very different based on revenue and industry. And so one of the things we'll always do is we do free reviews all the time because let's say you have a policy already. Chances are we already know that carrier really well and we're friends with them, right? So we're, we're happy to do those reviews for you and look, look for gotchas, look for things you may not have seen in it. And if I can kind of like, um, I don't want to say hate on the agents for a minute, but when we work, we have like 2000 agents, we work with threat through the U S right. So we love agents, but one of the problems that this caught that where this all comes from is sometimes a client goes to an agent and like, Hey agent, you do all my other insurance for business stuff. I also need cyber. And so because the agent is not educated in cyber, they'll do something like, Oh, cool. We're just going to stick what we call a warranty inside of your general liability policy. And that'll cover you maybe 50,000 for a, for a cyber breach, because the agent can't imagine that a breach would cost more than 50,000, like that graphic we showed you. And so those are some of the problems that exist here. And so to answer that question, I would say, yeah, you definitely let us do a free review and we'll just tell you what's going on with your policy. And then, yeah, you, you really do want to, be careful and we'll help you shop that market because some carriers are better than others based on your industry. Perfect. Thank you, Wes. We are going to come back to you for Q and a, but we're going to transition now to, um, we just described the issue, right? We described a solution around shopping for those cyber liability insurance for sure. Glad fifth wall and Wes was able to be here for that. Um, but we're going to transition now into Cisco Duo. We talked about MFA as being one of those key components of making sure that you even qualify for cyber liability insurance. And since last year, we've been looking at uh, Duo even more so, 2FA, MFA, access control, all of that because of stuff coming down for government regulation for making sure people aren't just willy-nilly susceptible to all these attacks. Um, so with that said, I'd like to introduce Caitlin Underwood. Um, she is an experienced account executive with honestly looking at her bio over a decade of working in the computer software industry. Um, Caitlin is skilled in sales consulting, communication, account management, leadership, and team building. Um, but what's also cool is Caitlin is part of Duo before Cisco. Uh, she's been with Duo since 2017 and is now a regional sales leader covering the South. Um, and I did want to mention she is based out of Houston, Texas, because I know uh, people who live in Texas definitely love Texas. So I wanted to make that part known. Um, Caitlin, thank you for being here today. Um, oh, the last thing. See, this is what happens when I break up my paragraphs. Outside of the office, this is something I asked Caitlin if she wanted to share. Um, she is a travel enthusiast, including spending four years in Singapore. Um, and recently, I'm very jealous of this. Uh, she recently attended the World Cup in guitar. So, Caitlin, again, thank you for being with us. Um, and we are going to jump right into this because I am taking a look at my time and um, I've enjoyed this conversation so far and the time shows. So, Caitlin, um, I'm sure many on the call have some understanding of what Cisco Duo is. But what are you seeing as the reasons companies are reaching out to you today? 
Yeah, thanks, Phil. First and foremost, thanks for having me and Wes, really great information. You know, customers come to us for a variety of reasons. Um, we were just talking about cyber insurance, so let's keep talking about it. I would say three out of the every five customers we're talking to are coming in because they have to meet that MFA requirement for cyber insurance. So that's a lot of our customers coming to us. But some are coming for compliance. The FTC safeguard is right around the corner on June 9th, where that also needs MFA. We have contracts that you know, customers need to win and one of the requirements of contracts are MFA. We support government federal additions. So really a variety of reasons. And then just like the normal, hey, we just wanna improve our security posture overall. Companies are small, we have mom and pop and we have large enterprises. So really a lot of different reasons, a lot of different types of customers. When also a lot of think about, hey, they come to us because you don't have MFA. Well, that's not always the case. Some people do, but as you can see here, a lot of people do have MFA, but it's really basic MFA. And so they need a more robust MFA solution to evolve with the security needs. You know, with attackers getting smarter and organizations scaling from like a perimeter perspective, you know, the, what we find is that it creates gaps where the attackers exploit those gaps in the current solutions. 80% of organizations, they're not prepared for these, these evolving threat, threats. And um, Phil, that's kind of where something like zero trust comes into play. So when we talk about zero trust, what exactly do we mean? I, it's definitely a term that I've heard a lot about. I know a little bit just from you know being in this a little bit, but why should companies be seeking a zero trust environment? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, zero trust, we hear, you know, the marketing term, but like really how does this apply to our environment? And first and foremost, I want to say zero trust is not one product. It's a culmination of products and strategy to help a, in a layered approach from a security perspective. Companies have evolved. We just talked about that with Wes. The pandemic, they sped up that evolution. So if you think about it, 10, 15 years ago, employees had one laptop, they're accessing their VPN, and boom, they had access to all their corporate resources. Those days are gone. Now we can divide, you know, access from your personal cell phone, you work remote. You know, we have offices in Austin and Ann Arbor and all over. I'm over here in Houston, Texas working. But sometimes I like to leave my house and I'll go to the coffee shop and I'll work from there. So that identity and that perimeter is really evolving and now is kind of it's perimeterless. So we have to start with kind of protecting those identities. So in the context of zero trust when it comes to dual, let's dial this in a little bit more. The whole point is like we are in never ever assuming trust. I'm not always logging in from Houston, Texas. Like you called out, I love to travel. So one day I may go travel overseas. But when I'm accessing my corporate resources overseas, should it be treated the same as, as if I'm, uh, I'm accessing it from my home office? No, it probably wants to do some more checks and balances. So not only does it want to assume the trust that Caitlin is logging in from Caitlin's you know, machine to access Caitlin's resources, it also wants to make sure that when I change scenarios like going overseas, it's continuously verifying. But then first and foremost is, in reality, should I even be accessing that resource in the first place? So we're also assuming that the right privilege is provided. So to kind of summarize all that up, trust is really should just never be assumed. We should earn the trust at entry and making sure we're checking for that trust along the way when you're accessing your corporate data. Awesome. So, and I'm sure this can lead us up to like some of the challenges companies are facing that duo uh, seeks to remedy for them. Yeah, absolutely. There are a ton of, we hear our customers talk about a variety of challenges. So we're gonna talk about three today. If you have other challenges outside of that, reach out to the team. You know, we're happy to walk through your challenges specifically, but here are some common challenges that we see. Um, let's talk about passwords. Passwords are annoying, they're hard to remember, but if they're easy to remember, then they're easy to compromise. And even if they are complex, they still get compromised. So imagine if you have 20 SaaS applications, you have your email, you have you know, Workday, your HR, you have 20 SaaS applications. Imagine if you had to remember 20 different username and passwords. 
I would never be able to be productive in my day at all. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't. So we help our customers consolidate experience with single sign-on and making sure that you're logging in with one username and password to all of your cloud resources and you're having a seamless end user experience. But single sign-on cannot be paired without security. So we have to make sure when we're accessing our single sign-on, our applications, we do it in a, with a secure manner and that's with strong authentication. Gone are the days where you can just get a code. You can get just get a, a text. That's not NIST compliant. We have to make sure we have stronger ways to do multi-factor authentication. So Duo relies on things like we have passwordless. Hey, why don't you just remove the password altogether and rely on stronger authentication forms that are fish-proof like biometrics. Um, we could talk about risk-based authentic authentication. So the scenario that I proposed about traveling overseas if I log in from Houston, but five minutes later, I'm, it says that I log in for Paris, France, I can't get to Paris in five minutes. And so you have to have more security in place to either block that or level up the security challenge to make sure that it truly is Caitlin accessing it from those type of locations. And it doesn't stop at MFA. We have to extend that to devices. So I'm gonna tell you like a real story that we were talking about with a customer a few weeks ago. This a customer was about a 500, 500 employee customer. And we were asking them like, walk us through your device landscape. What does that look like? And they said, they don't allow BYOD. And each person was given one laptop. So in their mind, they said, we have 500 employees. Therefore we have 500 laptops. And we asked them how you were enforcing that. Phil, let me ask you a question. How many devices do you have? Uh. So I'm a little bit of a hoarder. I definitely have four devices that I always use. Maybe a couple more for like my authentication, like you said, like a smartwatch or something like that. But yeah, it's 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 a little bit too much. <laughs> I'm the same way. I have four, five, maybe even six. Um, I am also a nerd. Uh, and so we talked about that with this customer and we flipped on Duo. That's exactly what was going in their environment. They had over 2000 devices accessing their corporate resources that they just had no visibility into. And so, even though you may think a customer, you know, your employees sign a policy that says, I can't use my personal device. Well, sometimes they do, but just because they're not bad actors could. And so we have to make sure that we're providing visibility, but also taking action. So from a compliance perspective, you wanna make sure all of these devices are meeting compliance before they're coming into your environment. What we typically see is some people, they have like AMP secure endpoint that they're managing from those. They have a, a jam, they have all these different tools, but then they have Chrome just came out with a zero day about two weeks ago. They have out of date Chrome devices accessing. They have things like crazy, like XP. We see this all the time. Um, jailbroken phones, like those type of devices shouldn't be going into your environment. And Duo can help with that. So Duo is more sh than just MFA. It extends to devices as well. I guess that kind of leads me into a question I have is, so now that we know the challenges, how does Duo actually help? Yeah, so to tie everything together about what we just spoke about, I'm going to use myself as an example. I am accessing Workday, so therefore, in the step one of establishing trust, I enforce multi-factor authentication. Then behind the scenes while I'm doing multi-factor authentication, and let me let me call out strong authentication using like a biometric, a YubiKey, push, you know, making sure that we're having more robust MFA methods. But it's also starting to do checks and balances of my devices like what we just spoke about. Then once it's moved from there, what Duo does is we have a layered, we have this really solid policy stack to say, well, Caitlin, we know the company that you work for doesn't do business overseas, so therefore our employees should not be accessing um, our corporate resources from anywhere but the U.S. So we block access altogether. We can block out-of-date devices, like we caught out with that zero day with Chrome. Anything that's coming in from a Chrome out-of-date browser, you have to go in and, and have your user um, update it before they can get in. You can enforce screen lock, and then once you have all that done, then you passed on through that HR system and Workday in my example. 
But now I'm I'm back on the plane. I'm traveling again, going back to Singapore, a place that I love dearly. And I go to Access Workday the next time. It shouldn't remember all of that before. It should have the data to know that I'm doing something completely different than what I've done previously. And so it steps up that authentication with that continuously verifying that trust with that risk-based analysis and authentication to make sure that you know, we're using maybe more phishing resistant MFA solutions because you're doing something out of the blue. This is all great from a user side, but what about the admins? So while we're doing all of this from a dual perspective, the admins are getting notified. There's logging in place to make sure that their users are accessing it correctly. There's not anomalies, and if there are, we're bringing that to their attention. So in summary, we provide more than just MFA. It's a secure and seamless experience for both the end user and the admins. Awesome. So that sounds good. Like the user experience being seamless, easy, the instant alerts, all of that. But how complicated is it to get set up? How complicated is it from the user side? Like I'm sure the admins would like to know that it's just going to take them two minutes and they're all up and running and protect their entire network. But what does that actually look like? Yeah, this is one of my favorite questions and probably one of our biggest differentiators here at Duo. Um, we help customers roll out insanely fast. So what does insanely fast mean? We've helped a 10,000 user um, employee company get rolled out over the weekend because they unfortunately went through a breach. We helped a 500 employee company get up and running the same day. We can move incredibly fast. I think after Cisco acquired Duo, um, when we rolled out Duo here internally for the Cisco environment, for 40,000 plus employees, Cisco's help desk got 0.05% help desk tickets. That's insane. That's wild for a 40,000 user company to roll out a new solution that hits every employee and not just get bombarded from a help desk perspective. We're incredibly easy to roll out. From the end user side, it takes about 20 seconds to enroll, then they're on their way. Um, from the admin side for integrations, I'll give you a few popular ones, email, we get that one all the time. It takes about 15 minutes. Protecting your local machine, about five. Your server, about five. And that's just a couple of examples. Our documentation is awesome. We walk our customers very detailed through the documentation, and we also have support to help with that if you need a little bit more hand-holding. So we move incredibly fast, and we want you as like the IT admins to focus on higher priority projects. Let Duo come in, roll it out quick, set it and forget it and have it do its thing while you can focus on higher priority projects. We don't want to bog you down. As an example, it's the holiday season, 10% of your employees get new phones. We don't want you to have to have the employee call you up, put MFA on their new device. We don't want that. We want to en enable the user to do all those things themselves. So this is where Duo shines, not only from the employee perspective, but also the IT, the administrative, the deployment, this is where Duo shines. Perfect. And I think I missed my cue here, but ah. it is that trade-off, right? Yeah. Um, where you want to be high productivity, um, with strong security, and, and that's the, yeah, mitigate the risk, but also don't make it too complicated that no one can use. 1,000%. Duo always says if security is too hard to use, no one wants to use it. If security is too easy to use, then it's not effective. So you have to really find that trade off of effectiveness and easy to use. Perfect. Um, so as far as Duo is concerned, I'm sure there are a lot of other ones out there. I know personally, I've heard of Google's, Microsoft, Okta, all of the competitors to what Duo um, is trying to be in the marketplace, right? So how does Duo stack up against the rest? Why yeah. should people look at Duo before or alongside of their other MFA um, possibilities? Yeah, great, great. We get this all the time. First and foremost, we love those providers. We love Microsoft. We love Google. We love the Octus of the world. The reason why is we are not an identity provider. We want to keep your primary credentials in one place and your secondary credentials in another place. And so we work with those solutions. We have custom integrations with them. But 
what we hear from our customers who move away from them and the reason why they move away from them is because they need more coverage. Those big box providers are great at protecting their environments, but not everything is in those environments. You may have a multi-cloud environment. You may not have a cloud environment at all and you are mostly on-prem. So our coverage is vast and we integrate with so many more different types of applications. So you have that one MFA, going back to Lord of the Rings, one MFA to rule them all. That's why people choose Duo. And that's why people come in and they, they need a more robust MFA solution. So if you say, hey, we have MFA, still encourage y'all talk to the Duo team and the Rhino team, because what we find is most of the time there are gaps and that's where we can help you. And then speed to security, we talked about that. We can get up and running a lot quicker than most of our providers out there. And then lastly, ease of use. Imagine having your single sign-on, your device posturing, your logs, from all of your environment in one place. You can go in from one dashboard and look at all that. You're not having to navigate multiple tools or logins. We're agnostic. We work with a lot of different providers out there and can really plug in the gaps and bring those systems together. But, you know, don't take my word for it. Um, you know, we included some testimonials. We're happy to walk through these. Um, I'll, I won't read these, but, you know, just a couple of stories from our customers about how easy we are to use um, and how we are from a zero trust perspective. Awesome. Well, thank you both. Um, I want to get into our Q&A session uh, because we did run. I ran a little long. I just had too many questions. I'm sorry. Um, but I think it's been great information. Uh, I honestly, like I said, whenever I talk to Wes and Caitlin, learned so much uh, about all of this. And I would encourage you guys, if you have any follow-up questions, definitely come to Rhino, um, reach out to a Duo team member, um, reach out to Fifth Wall to start that cyber liability insurance um, discussion. But uh, to kind of to go into the Q&A just a little bit, um, we're probably gonna have to stick to the ones that were given to us prior to the session, but we will make sure we get answers to the ones in the chat sent out after this. Um, so Wes, uh, the first question is for you. Um, comes from Mark in Arizona. Is there one or two preferred cybersecurity insurance companies? No, we kind of talked on this a little bit uh, um, towards the end of our discussion, but um, just like talking again. Yeah. Hey, Mark. Um, great question. So, and I'm going to go light speed on a couple of these so we can save a lot of time. Um, so we don't like, again, I don't, it, it it's an individual conversation is the best way to say it. So reach out to us and we'd be happy to talk to you. I mean, there are certain, there are certain carriers that like, we just don't prefer for certain markets, for certain industries. There are certain ones that we love and we can just say, look, one of these three is going to be the ones that you're going to want to go with this year. So it's just an individual one-on-one -on -one conversation. So there aren't like black balls and like only goes there. Aren't none of that kind of stuff. So reach out to us. Perfect. Um, and Caitlin, Brad from California asked, uh, with so many cloud services and providers, how does Cisco Duo integrate with them? Yeah, so we have multiple integrations. Um, we support things like Radius, LDAP, SAML, Web SDK, um, you name it, we support it. Bis biggest recommendation, reach out the team, we'll understand your environment and we'll figure out how we can play a role. Awesome. And uh, Wes, next question is from Michael in Texas. <clears throat> Will we ever see consistency <clears throat> from the carriers in how they measure or assess insurability in terms of the important controls um, they see as critical to insurability? Again, great question. We did talk on it, but is there anything more to add? What a great question. So, you know, every carrier is different, right? They all supply their own underwriters and they have their own style. I mentioned the five required controls. There's some unification there, but there's a push in the industry right now to get to what we call continuous underwriting. Let me give you an example of this. The carriers are saying things like, well, look, do you have MFA or do you not, right? But what they really wanna know is, is that MFA actually rolled out correctly? So wouldn't it be cool if the carriers could figure out a way to say, well, Duo is a modern platform, it's got an API. Couldn't we grab some of that usage data from Duo as part of the underwriting and say, we actually wanna authenticate that it's rolled out everywhere. So you know how, it's just like we put the beacon in our windshield and then we get discounts on insurance based, um, yeah, based on how we drive, you know, like the drive safe and safe. That's the way the carriers are moving right now is they're moving to a data-driven 
perspective to say it's not just what you fill out in the form, it's also what can you show us? And then we're going to give you discounts on that. So if you've got Duo rolled out and you've got it rolled out in best practice according to Duo, you're measurably lower risk to us. We're going to give you a discount for that. That's the future of where we're going. We still need about three to four years for this to be fully rolled out because the carriers are still ancient. Keep in mind the insurance industry is half a millennia old. And so when we talk about things like APIs, they're like, AP what? How do you, that sounds like black magic. How do you do that? So, so we need to give them some time at fifth. Well, we're working on some of these things with them. Um, but yeah, that's going to be the future. And I actually think it's exciting, not scary because um, finally we can get some data that drives decision-making here. Yeah. Speaking of that, my 70% driver score with a uh, drive safe and save isn't really saving me a lot, but hopefully everyone else there has a uh, better luck. Um, last question I'm going to ask to both of you is, um, from Taylor in Washington, how does, and I just want to throw this one in there because AI is becoming such a big thing, but how does AI play a role in zero trust? Let me take that one first. Sure, ladies first. Yeah, awesome. Um, so if you think about like chat GPT, actors now have the ability to write emails based off of social engineering things that you know what we know about certain people and so now you can take these emails and tailor it and send it out to people to try to get them to click on links and things of that nature and so those emails coming through from a phishing perspective more likely you're going to fall for them and so you need something like mfa to make sure that on it's understanding what might be different out of the blue with that rba type of behavior and you're forcing better security policies so there's a lot of things that we can do in that area, but the threats are going to be evolving and you're going to need a more a solution that's born out of security to help with those threats coming in from like the AI perspective. Perfect. Wes, do you have anything? You want to I think she covered that very, very well. All right. I think so too. Yeah, I just Caitlin. wanted to ask you both. Well, everybody, that is um, gonna wrap it up for today. I really appreciate you all um, joining us. We do have a couple more things I want to touch on. Uh, the next couple minutes is if you attended today, you were entered into one of these prizes, um, except for the top left. There is something that we're going to ask you to do to enter into the prize for the TV raffle. And if you want to take a minute to get that May 4 secure um, code there, it's going to be a unique code for when you go over and sign up for a free trial of Duo. Or if you wanted to even look at other security measures Cisco has that Rhino offers, such as uh, Wes mentioned um, Cisco AMP, which is now called Secure Endpoint. Uh, that is one of them. There is a cloud mailbox defense, um, which covers your uh, Office 365 email as well and enhances your security there. So there's a lot of different security measures that can be taken place that help you get the best liability insurance coverage as well as rate. Um, but you can also sign up for a trial of Duo at this link on your page, the free trial.rhinonetworks.com. So, again, wanted to thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Wes. Thank you, Caitlin, for being a part of this. Um, I know it was great on my side. I hope it was for everyone listening. But hope you have a great rest of your May 4th, and uh, may the 4th be with you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.